So, um, where should I start? Well, maybe from the title. Uh, the title that uh, reporting from the front, uh, it's a way to express that to produce a quality built environment, it's difficult, it's tough, it, uh, it encounters a lot of resistance. Uh, so, in a way, to go beyond the current conditions and the, the business as usual, as soon as you want to step even one millimeter out of those conditions, you encounter a lot of resistance from the different forces at play. Those forces could be, let's say, the difficulty or the, or the constraints of the context and circumstances, lack of resources, uh, weakness of the institutions, mm -hmm. uh, the difficulty of the problem uh, that has to be addressed. Uh, so <coughs> it could be from the circumstances or it could be from the nature of the forces at play, let's say the greed of, the, of capitalism or the laziness of bureaucracy. Uh, in any case, as soon as you want to produce something that is beyond business as usual, uh, you encounter resistance and in a way it is a battle. That would be a front and these front lines are very different. The idea of reporting from that front is to listen from those to have the problem to make a proposal against those difficult circumstances. Uh, what can we learn from them? When ca what are the tipping points that they may eventually encountered while trying to improve the current living conditions? What were the, the, the moment or the creative moment or the idea that made them to beyond, go beyond that conventional uh, circumstance and, sh and have them share with the rest of us that knowledge, that uh, those, so that we leave the exhibition with more tools. So this is, I would say, in general, the, um, the attitude, the idea of this uh, reporting from the front title. Eventually, when going to an architectural exhibition, you see <coughs> a lot of, of responses, a lot of answers in the form of a project. Normally, and, and this is quite nice in the sense that the, the nature of architecture is that you see objects that in principle should be self-explanatory. There's, there's, no there's no a guide in the city explaining why buildings are the way they are. I mean, they should be, in a very obvious way, they, if they're there, they address something, they improve the condition, they, they solve the problem, or they capture the imagination of a given part, a neighborhood or a society or a culture. But uh, in, an, in the case of an architectural exhibition, it in principle should be like that too. But since we, would l we do not only have the problem of using architecture, part of the people that come here uh, have the problem of the blank page, the, they have the problem of make of making a contribution or a proposal, of inventing something, we would like those practitioners that m made something, that came up with some invention, to share with, that, with us what were those strategies that they used. So we're asking them before just conveying or agreeing in the answer, we would like to understand what was the question that they were trying to address. You will see it in different forms. In the introductory room here, you will see the list of, of words uh, that are a threat to the quality of the built environment. Inequalities, uh, poverty, uh, pollution, waste, uh, immigration, climate change, uh, insecurity or crime, traffic. So this kind of things that every single person, not just an expert, suffers in the city, uh, the mediocrity or the bala banality of our peripheries. I mean, you, you know, there's a list of this kind of simple words in the sense that maybe the problem is tough and complex, but it's easy to understand. You don't need a seminar that when you say insecurity, you say, okay, we have a, an issue here. Uh, then the solution might be complex and then there are projects trying to exemplify what was required to move ahead in trying to address such, uh, such an issue. But there's a list of, and we could name those the battles, which are the threats against the quality of the built environment. Uh, so the first thing was to try to agree in that we do have a challenge with, in those realms, in those dimensions of, um, 
and, and actually I use the word the built environment and not city because in the end the entire world has in the end has to have a form and there will be another uh, uh, text in the, in, the, in the introductory room it's called architecture is uh, not for, for making a big definition or to go into posterity just to understand each other and it starts by saying that architecture is about giving form to the places where people live. It's not more complicated than that, but not easier than that. This rather apparently inoffensive sentence, giving form to the places where people live, I would distinguish in here three words. Form, places, life. The places where we all live <coughs> range from a house to housing, to schools, to office buildings, to parks, to squares, to the sidewalk, every single uh, part of the built environment has inevitably to have a form. Somebody has to give a form to those places where we do our daily life. And by giving form in, an, in one way or another, you may qualify in a good way that those moments, those situations, those uh, gatherings of people, or you may ruin them uh, because, because you were not skilled enough or maybe because the forces at play were not amicable enough. So it is about the places to which somebody inevitab inevitably has to give a form. So it is important to understand what informs the form of those places. And this again goes back to the question of identifying the forces at play. One of the dimensions that is a more typical one expected from architecture is the aesthetical quality of those forms so that they respond to, let's say, or to the beauty or the cultural layer, uh, which is already something that we have gained. The society expects from architects that they should deliver beautiful places for where people live. But that's only one of the forces at play. There are other forces to which we should respond as well. Economical forces, political forces, uh, social forces, environmental, legal, you name it. I mean, the, the condition of architecture it ha is that it has a rather complex, non-specific start starting point. By that I mean, it's not that we're trying to solve architects' issues. These are society's issues. And that's why, coming back to the list of battles, these words are common, common in the sense of, ordina of ordinary and shared. Traffic, you don't have to be an expert, first of all, to have an idea that we have a problem there, but also because all of us have suffered it, and all of us may have a say, we're allowed to have a say about traffic as a user. Uh, so, <coughs> the forces at play that inform the form of a project is the kind of things that we would like to start to agree with and these are the, the kind of the, the battles. And once we, underst we have understood the range of places in which life takes place, it would be great if we could share knowledge in what does it take to produce a better form than another in order to host life. So this is, I would say, the first part of the sentence. It's a wide range of places. Somebody has to give form to them and the forces that inform the form of a proje project are rather wide and diverse and eventually even pulling in opposite directions. This is what uh, is at the base of the difficulty of producing a quality built environment. What is life in the end? We tend to believe, or maybe f until now, media has understood this title, reporting from the front, as trying to tackle the kind of humanitarian end of the spectrum of life, satisfying basic needs, where, where the most uh, uh, simple manifestations of the human condition are threatened. That's why refugees and immigration and poverty and lack of access to sanitation and all that is expected in this Biennale to be tackled. And there will be some exa examples taking care of that end of the spectrum. But we may have sold all the basic needs, and yet, we, I, I, we, I guess we agree that we couldn't 
we wouldn't be able to call that life. That maybe is survival. So life is not only about satisfying basic needs, but it's also it being able to tackle and, uh, and respond and give form to the more intangible dimensions of the human condition. So it goes from the basic, physical, concrete, down-to-earth needs to hard-to-grasp intangible desires, the unspeakable certainties that we tend to expect to be uh, included in the form of a building so that you talk not just to the daily life but also to the extra extraordinary dimensions of, uh, of life. From the individual to the collective, from the, from the concrete, tangible, basic to the most sophisticated dimensions of the human condition. So far, let's say, from, from the title, I guess that there's an expectation to cover the end of the spectrum that was a little bit neglected by architecture so far. From the society, the way it is today, we're, we're expected to respond to the more intangible dimensions of the human condition, the artistic side. I would say that this is not about choosing one or the other. The debate shouldn't be if architecture that until now was artistic or iconic uh, now should be a uh, humanitarian kind of thing. The difficulty and the challenge is that architecture should be able to integrate the whole range because life in itself is about simultaneously being in the whole range of life uh, in the end. So, if there's any, any power in architecture, that's the power of synthesis. The more complex the problem, the more the need for synthesis. That being said, <coughs> if architecture is about giving form to the places where people live, this apparently inoffensive sentence, what we will see here are examples of people that were trying to organize all that information that informs a project into a proposal key. If there are challenges, threats, problems uh, that seem to be rather difficult to be addressed or to find the solution, well, just to raise awareness about the, the conflicts that we may be suffering, raising awareness is necessary but not enough. We should be able to go beyond and propose something. And this is very important in architecture. At the core of architecture, there's always a project. And the project is organizing information in a proposal key. So <clears throat> what we should be able to see while going through the exhibition is two things. First, the capacity to identify as clearly as possible a problem. What is the issue? I wrote a text, actually. There will be a, a kind of totem with the, with a, the catalog will have that, too where I try to say, why should we care about spending time in the project that is in front of us? I mean, why does it matter? Uh, somehow it's about being able to go beyond the question of, so what? Um, we, we tend to not to take the risk to clearly say why that project matters or why that architect was invited. So, one thing is to be able to understand as clearly as possible what is the battle, what is the problem, what was the challenge, what were the conditions of the problem. That's one part. And then simultaneously see as an exhibition that was able to make a proposal for that identified challenge or battle. The distance is not necessarily, not always in architecture, and this is the beauty of the thing, is not necessarily direct or let's say is not a, a direct cause and effect uh, solution but we should be able to in a clear way say well this was the issue here this is what we should care about spending time in front of this exhibition and then whatever the tool was uh, uh, used to communicate that a model a film a mock-up a one-to-one -one, uh, scale piece of, of the building how that problem was addressed. So the best thing would be to explain how that works. We made a very big effort as curators to be able to, as clearly as possible, identify the problem and then suggest the architects what was the best way to communicate what they did to address that problem they, were, they had identified. Um, 
So I guess that about the content. I think it is important that as in, in everything, <coughs> once you, how do you, how do you say it in English, you preach with the example. Uh, so the, um, the curator's introductory rooms uh, are in a way something like that. We, we had to have here and uh, in Arsenale rooms explaining this, what we're talking here, why reporting from the front, what are the challenges of the built environment, uh, why inviting this and other architects. So there was the need to have two introductory rooms anyhow. How to do that? Well, in one of the battles we identify as being relevant was sustainability and taking care of, uh, of the uh, environment and the amount of waste that is producing in the world nowadays is one of the threats against the sustainability of the environment. Well, we start by ourselves. What can we do? How can we design these rooms to walk our own talk? And if waste, in this case, was an issue, we started by taking all the waste material produced by the dismantling of the previous Biennale to build the two introductory rooms, both here at Arsenale. 100 tons of debris, 10,000 square meters of plasterboard, 14 kilometers of metal studs that were used in the previous Biennale to create the gallery kind of environment well, we took that, the gypsum board that you see here in the entrance is part of this, those 100 tons of plasterboard just layered in a different way. So it's not just by a, and showing waste, a kind of in-your-face kind of thing. It was more, can design, can if you spend creative time in how to use a waste material, so that you expand the life cycle of it, it prevented from us to buy more stuff uh, to, cr to do our own introductory rooms. It saved some, not only some money, but in general, a lot of energy, that energy that was consumed in producing those materials anyhow. But with the right to design, it acquired some quality some, or some value that is independent from the cost. So if you have a valuable thing, it's not necessarily or shouldn't come only from the quality of the material, but from the way you used it. And this, by definition, is one of the uh, contributions design can make to the built environment. This is a very specific case, but in, we wanted at least ourselves not to commit the same mistake of producing more waste if we identified that as one of the battles uh, to be addressed. This is important. <coughs> If the problem that the person is trying to address, it's relevant, and if, if it's relevant, it's very likely that it's rather difficult. The notion of a success, it will be always be relative and not absolute. It's not like producing a very iconic building that has to be judged within its own set of rules. If the problem is, it matters and is relevant, it is important to make the exercise of understanding the conditions of that project and what could have been if we, that person did not that. Normally those battles are not won 100 to 0, are won 51 to 49. But if the problem was a relevant one, it still matters to have made that one millimeter improvement. Of course, this will have require from us architects to adjust our notion of success. We will have to be able to live with that 49 that didn't work. But yet, again, if the problem matters, I guess this is the kind of, of paradigm shifts that we shifts that we would like in this Biennale to be highlighted. Uh, you're more open to criticism? Yes, and uh, you can say, and well, this is a success? Well, relatively speaking, yes. Uh, but this is not perfect. Of course it's not perfect. But I guess that what more, more than perfection, when you're dealing with a relevant issue, a powerful outcome, it, it's more the case than a perfect uh, project. 